Um, for today's reading from uh, our, our series in Romans, I'd like to ask Brother Ryan if he would come, please. Thank you. Uh, good morning, church. Today we'll be reading from Romans 12, 15 to 21. So would you please stand with me as I read? Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind towards one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have high regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place for to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed them. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you, are, you will heap coals on the fire of his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word to us. Your word is life. Your word is powerful. Your word brings us life. Lord, I pray today that your word would minister to us, that it would find its mark in each of our hearts. Change us through your word, Lord. Father, if there is anybody here who is still unsure of their own salvation, their relationship with you, their God and creator, I pray today that you would stir in that person's heart and draw them to the one who loves them, the one who made them, the one who can save them and forgive them and give them a new life. Help us to understand this passage better. And as believers, may we apply it. May we live it. May we obey. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, just before I kick off, I just want to say a thank you to so many of you who have ministered to uh, me and Jen this, this week. Uh, if you don't know, Jen had an accident on Monday. Uh, we were bike riding, and uh, we, we, had, we were heading out on Monday morning. It was about 8.30 and to get some breakfast and uh, coffee. And we got to a traffic light. And I look over at Jen and say, you okay? She's like, I'm okay. Light turns green and I head across and I hear a bang. And I get to the other side and I look back and she's down on the ground. And I don't know what happened. I had to wait for the traffic to be able to get back to her. But there were lots of people, school kids even helping her. Um, anyway, so what happened was she just blacked out and fell, hit her uh, right on her chin, and uh, it broke her jaw in the back. And so we waited for the ambulance to come check everything out, and they took her. She spent two nights in the hospital, and um, she's back home now. Uh, she's probably watching right now as I speak, and so I want to be careful I don't share too much that I shouldn't share. Uh, she's home, and she had to have a, a surgery to put stuff in her mouth to keep things uh, together for about six weeks. So um, just pray for Jen. It's not easy. It looks very uncomfortable. Uh, she's had like, quite a lot of pain this week, and she can only drink liquids, so it's... Uh, going to be a, a trial, but uh, I was, first of all, I was just so blessed that so many on the road uh, were so willing to help. We had school boys uh, from Botany come lend assistance, stay with Jen while I was there, uh, while I was trying to get to her. We had an elderly fellow retired, and he came, didn't leave, and until the ambulance came. We had another young fella stop, and, and he just did whatever he could, brought her some water, brought her a, a hoodie from his car to put under her head, and um, we had another lady, uh, and when the ambulance had come, she said, hey, I'll, I'll take your bikes for you, and I'll lock them up and look after them. I said, thank you. Um, it was just wonderful. Uh, the hospital was wonderful. Many uh, doctors and the nurses, just a uh, real blessing uh, to us. 
But then the church family has just been uh, incredible. Incredible. Uh, the amount of prayers and love and help that you have given is really ministered to not only Jim, but to me. So, thank you. But now we've got to get into God's Word, too. Because God's Word is practical. Uh, throughout this book of Romans, He's given us a lot of doctrine. Uh, gospel doctrine of who we are about sin and about uh, how we are saved by grace and completely not of ourselves, but by God's grace. And now at this part, this juncture in chapter 12, he's taking us in a different direction and saying, this is what it's going to look like in your life. It's not just theoretical doctrine that you've got to memorize and, 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 you know, just remember that. But it's doctrine that must have practical application. And that's what this is about. Applying God's word. Applying what God has done for us. What God has done to you. Today's text isn't an easy text for most people. Albert Barnes, who was a great theologian in the 1800s. And he's wrote many books and commentaries. But of this passage, he says, it's probably one of the most difficult precepts of Christianity. But the law of Christ on the subject is unyielding. It is a solemn demand made on his all his followers, and it must be obeyed. It's a difficult one, but it must be obeyed. What is it? Well, first of all, let's see how we are to see people like Jesus. We'll get to the most difficult part in just a moment. But first of all, we are to see people like Jesus sees people. Look at verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. We'll stop here before verse 16. But think of the example of Jesus. Who was Jesus? Jesus was God in the flesh, God incarnate, God dwelling and living among us. And he could have easily have kept himself above and outside of our lives. After all, he was God. He's the creator. He's worthy. And we were sinful beings. And he's a holy and righteous God and creator. And so he could have kept himself above the fray and uh, apart from our lives, here to do his work that he came to do, save us from sin, die on the cross at the appointed time. But in the Gospels, we don't see him doing that. In the Gospels, we don't see that taking place. We see, in fact, what is the very first miracle of Jesus on the cross? The very first miracle? Not, not, uh, did I say on the cross? The very first miracle of Jesus in his ministry. Okay. Changing water into wine. What was that? That was at a wedding. He was there at a time of rejoicing. And, he, and his first miracle is at a great event. A rejoicing time. He also took time to weep with those who wept. And I think of a time like when Lazarus died and all his family were weeping and Jesus went with them and he wept with them. It hurt. There's a time for both. In our lives as Christians, there's a time for both. A time for weeping, time for mourning. And we are to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. I remember clearly a time, it's been a number of years ago now, um, I had to go with some family over to Ethel's house. Ethel was a, our eldest lady in the church for many years. She was with us at the very beginning of the early church here. And I went over to her house because we had some news to give her that one of her grandsons had died in an auto accident. Passed away. And while I was there and we were talking to her and and she was just 
in shock and beside herself. At the same time, I get a text on my phone from another family in the church saying their baby boy was just born, and they were so happy and so excited. And at that very moment, I just had this, uh, it was just such a reminder to me of how we weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. And sometimes it's simultaneous that at the same time we had rejoicing going on and, and we had weeping going on. What is this verse saying to us? I believe we must be genuinely just interested in people's lives. Genuinely interested in people's lives. Love must be sincere. Sincere. I've mentioned before about a class that I took. I was in Bible school. This was back in around 1988, in the autumn time in 1988 in the States, in Missouri. And that was where I met Jen, by the way. And I was in this class in my first semester there. It was a class on uh, evangelism. It was a, supposed to be a class on sharing your faith with others. But over and over, I felt that this particular class taught us how to get the responses that we want from people so that we can get them to where we want them to be. Manipulating the right response from somebody. Such examples came in the form of uh, when we're explaining to people that they are sinners in need of salvation, and we explain to them what sin is, and and if we ask them... uh, Have you sinned in your life? We're supposed to nod our head up and down like this. Because when you're talking to people nodding your head, they tend to nod their head back to you. It's psychology. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? (laughs) Everybody in. Nod your head together. Uh, And things like that. When discussing the resurrection of Christ, you know, you bring up Easter. You celebrate Easter, don't you? Well, they maybe celebrate Easter with chocolates and eggs and bunnies, but that doesn't mean that they understand the resurrection of Christ. But we get the right responses that we want, and then we get them to say the words that we want them to say in the form of the prayer. And that's the main thing. And we had to do this. We had to do this a couple of times to people that we knew. And so I had some longtime friends that I knew didn't know the Lord, didn't know Christ, and And I had them in my mind, I'm going to do this to them. And so I met up with them, and I took them through everything. I did the head nodding, and they nodded back. I said, do you want to pray now with me? And yeah, okay, and they did. And they never, from that point on, cared to see me again. Why? Well, it could be other reasons I'm not aware of, but I think one of them might be that wasn't sincere. It wasn't sincere love. It was manipulation. It was to get what I wanted. But it wasn't sincere love. Care for people genuinely. And I do say thank you to so many who have showed genuine care and love to my wife. Jen, this past week. This is doctrine applied. This is doctrine shown in practical ways. Weep with those who weep. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Next, verse 16, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Another way of saying this is don't be too big for your britches. Don't think you're all that. Humble. Humble. It literally means to be of the same mind toward one another. Literally means to think the same thing toward each other. It doesn't mean that we must agree on every single thing because you get together, you're going to have disagreements. But we are agreeable. There's a difference. When I was younger, independent Baptists had a reputation for being fighting Baptists. Fighting. This is not a good reputation. It's not right. It's not necessary. 
We can disagree on some things, but not still be agreeable with one another because we're family. We love each other. We are genuinely care for each other. And while we understand we disagree on something, it doesn't change who we are. The next part emphasizes the central point of this epistle. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. On high things, it doesn't mean God or spiritual things. It means on things that are up here and everyone else is down here. And you are just too spiritual pretty much for everybody else. But it emphasizes... Uh, the central point of this letter, this epistle, that we are all sinners, that we are all saved by God's grace rather than anything that we have done. And if we have that deep understanding in the core of our being and the very foundation of our doctrinal understanding of the word of God, then the result is going to be humility. Because I cannot take credit for anything that God has done. I cannot say, God knew what he was doing. He saved me. Look who he got. God, you know, he might not save everybody, but he he saw something in me. We're saved by grace and grace alone. And all I can do is look at that and say, thank you, Lord. You saved an unworthy person like me. Therefore, we are equals under God's grace. Paul was writing to who? The Roman church, the Roman Christians. And at the time, I'm sure that in the Roman church, there would have been some who were saved, who were slaves, and they came to faith. The Roman Empire had many, many slaves. I forget the exact numbers, but something like a third of the population were slaves. It was a huge slave-driven society. And so many of them would have been slaves. And on the other hand, there would have been many who would have come from very influential families as well. And so you have those from influential families who likely had servants or slaves in the household, and they grew up with that. And then you had others who were slaves, and they they came to faith. And now they're part of the church. God's grace is the great equalizer. In this building, we have people from all different walks of life, all different countries. Some have come from well-to-do families. Others had very little or nothing growing up. Some are well-offs. Others are struggling even today. But we're family in Christ. And so Paul's reminding them, don't Set your mind on high things. Associate with the humble. Why? Because they're family. And don't be wise in your own opinion. Be interested in others. Then we come to number two. And this is where it gets hard. How we are to respond to evil. This is where it gets more difficult. Paul now shifts to how we actually live in the world where sometimes people do bad things. Some people may just not like you or maybe not like what you stand for or, or yes, even your faith. And What do we do? Do we stick up for ourselves? We don't want to let people walk all over us. How do we respond as followers of Christ? First we see, do not repay evil for evil. That's what verse 17 says. Repay no one evil for evil. And maybe you're here, you say, wait a minute. Doesn't the law say, doesn't the Bible say somewhere? I know it says somewhere. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. You familiar with that phrase? comes from the law comes from exodus it comes from leviticus it's in the law and jesus dealt with this very objection he dealt with this question already in matthew chapter 5 verse 38 jesus says you have heard it that it was said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth but i tell you not to resist an evil person 
or not to stand up to, not to fight against. Don't retaliate. So Jesus says he addresses this issue of the law. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. You smack me on the face, I'm going to smack you back. You steal money from me, I'm going to steal from you. You say something nasty to me, I'll say something nasty back. You cut in front of me in line, I'm going <laughs> to cut back in front of you. And this is our nature. But the law from Exodus and the law from Leviticus here, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, was never intended to be used by individuals for retribution. It never was. That wasn't its intent. It was given to the collective society of Israel uh, for justice and to also prohibit and not allow retribution more than what was warranted. That's what it was for. But it wasn't for someone to say, oh, you smack me, I'm going to smack you back. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, doesn't it say? Jesus says, no. That's not how I work. That's not how my followers work. So our clear instruction in the New Testament is when someone does us wrong, we do not do wrong back. Jesus mentioned In the Gospels, when he was teaching, he mentioned a few examples. He said, if someone slaps you on the cheek, what do you do? You say, here, I got one more side. Go ahead. When someone takes away your coat, what do you do? You say, hey, would you like a matching shirt to go with that? That's what he's saying. When someone says, hey, I need you to walk a mile with me. What do you do? You say, sure. Would you like me to go to the second one too? This is Jesus' teaching. And this is the part that goes so contrary to our human nature. And we say, wait a second, that's not fair. That's not right. Won't they walk all over me? So we don't repay evil for evil. Instead... We reply to evil with good. So it's not just that we don't respond back with evil, but we counter it with good. That's an active response, not passive. Verse 17, repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. The word for good things, by the way, it's can be translated as beautiful, beautiful. So have regard for beautiful things in the sight of all men. That beautiful is referring uh, the character and attitudes. Have regard is also something that can be translated to prepare something in advance. So when we put all this together, it's saying, be ready, prepare in advance To show beautiful things in the sight of all men. And this is in the context of those who have done you evil. So this idea of turning the cheek, walking the extra mile. This idea cannot just be left up to chance and wait until the moment it happens. Because when someone strikes you on the cheek, your human nature is going to get up and say, oh yeah. I'm going to strike you back. So what he's saying here is be prepared. Be prepared. And how do we prepare? Living with the Lord, walking with the Lord, being in tune with the Lord, in tune with the Spirit of God. And so when that cheek strike comes, then you're ready to respond. Not just not repaying evil for evil, but being prepared to show beauty. To show beauty. In our response, in our attitudes, something that will bring glory to God, glory to Jesus Christ. By the way, this idea of doing good, even to those who mean you harm, isn't just a New Testament only thing. Jesus didn't say, I'm giving you something new. It was in the old as well. 
Just many people didn't want to focus on that as much. Example is like Exodus 23. One example of many. If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall surely bring it back to him again. Whose ox or donkey? Whose animal? Your enemy. Someone who hates you. Someone who's done you wrong. And you see he has a problem. Something serious to them. He's lost some of his possessions. Get it. And you bring it to him. This is showing something beautiful in the sight of all men. He says then, the Exodus says, If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying under its burden, and you would refrain from helping it, you shall surely help him with it. So you see a donkey, he's flat on his back, he can't move because he's stuck. Maybe his burden's too heavy, he's going to die, and you can walk by, but it belongs again to someone who hates you. And you can say, serves him right. What a jerk. He deserves this. But it says, no, even if you initially say, hey, I, I don't need to help. The Bible says you shall help them. Help that animal. Help that person's possessions, that person's belongings. And then verse 18 of our text says, If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. This is the calling of God's people. Be loving without hypocrisy. And God doesn't hold us accountable for the other person's response. That's why Paul writes and says, as much as depends on you, if possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably. You do what God wants you to do. You live and, and react and respond as God would have you to respond to somebody, even your enemy, even to someone who hates you. You do what a follower of Christ is supposed to do. What they do is up to them. And you're not responsible for that. You cannot change people. You cannot change someone's heart. You cannot change a culture. You cannot change a country. God can. But God tells you, his follower, what you are to do. How you are to look. How you are to represent him. And he says to you to do something that is beautiful. Be prepared to do something beautiful in the sight of all men. I believe God at times allows bad things to happen to his followers like us so that we can, at that time, do something beautiful. So that people can see our responses, how we handle it, and they may take a step back and say, well, why? And we can say, because I belong to Jesus Christ. I'm following him. He's my example. I love the Lord. And he tells me to love you too. God allows things to happen to us so that we can be a light that shines brighter. Number three, why we respond by doing good. We know what we're supposed to do. Why? First of all, vengeance does not belong to us. Get that out of your head. Verse 19, beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So first we see vengeance is God's prerogative. Why? He's God. He can handle it. I can't. Aren't you glad it's God's prerogative? Have you ever in your life been one uh, to jump to some conclusions something happened and you jumped to conclusions and it stirred anger in your heart for such a long period of time against somebody and then you finally just let them have it only to realize that you actually had it all wrong you ever been there you didn't see all the sides you didn't see all the issues if you're honest i think it probably happens a lot more than you realize One thing you need to avoid is attributing motive to people. 
They meant to do this. They hate me. They hate this or that. They're just bad people. They're just evil people. Some assume the other person means ill will, evil intent. Give people benefit of the doubt. Assume good intent, even if their actions are wrong, something that you wouldn't do or approve of. But assume good intent at least. Even if their way seems wrong to you. Therefore, because of that, we are to give place to wrath. What this doesn't mean is, you know, there's a place for wrath in your life. No, it means we give that place to God who can handle it. It's not our wrath. It literally means leave room for God's wrath. Leave it to God. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. This is not what we're to say. Sometimes I see people using this verse and, oh, he, he did something. He did me bad. He did me dirty. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. This is not for you. This is for you to remember this is God. God is the judge. It's God's just judgment. And as followers of Christ, our desire ought to be for everyone to find not God's judgment, but peace with God. God's forgiveness. So even those who have done you dirty, done you wrong, don't use this. Well, vengeance is mine. God's going to get them one day. And I can't wait for that day. Oh, they're going to burn. Our desire, because of sincerity of love, and because of the humility, because we realized we were saved only by grace. It wasn't something extra special in us that they didn't have. Our desire is that they find the same grace. Pray for your enemy. Pray for those who hate you. Not that they'll face God's wrath and judgment one day and they'll really get it then, but that they'll find the grace that you found. Pray for your enemies. So we see vengeance does not belong to us. And then lastly, we see responding with good makes victory more likely. And by the way, what is victory? It's not that you win and they lose. It's not that you let them have it. They see how bad they were and and vengeance is God's and he lets them have it. And then you can watch from a distance and say, yeah, that worked out pretty good. They're suffering now. No, that's not victory. What is your goal in responding to things? Verse 21 says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We want to overcome evil. That's our goal. That's where victory is. Overcoming evil. So how can we overcome evil and see a person and see a society change and see this victory? If we react like an avenger, if we react like a defender or even a resistor, we confirm to the opposition that might makes right. I'm going to fight for what is right. I'm going to fight for my rights. I'm going to fight for my justice. If we react as helpless, we then confirm to the opposition that we're just weak. And that's not the intent either. The only way is by reacting with active goodwill. Even if they're not deserving. Goodwill. I want God's best for you. I'm praying for you. I want God's blessings on your life. Romans 5, 8. God demonstrated his own love toward us while we were still sinners... Christ died for us. He's our example. It doesn't say while we were out looking for God and trying our best to do good things. 
Well, he came and died for us. We were the enemies. We were the evil ones. We were the wrongdoers. We were the ones that smacked him across the cheek. But while we were enemies, he gave to us. He died for us. And not only this, but we have a clear example of our Savior Jesus in 1 Peter chapter 2. An example and a command. For this, for to this you were called. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. That you should follow his steps. He's our example. Follow his steps. Do what he did. Verse 22. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he committed himself to him who judges righteously. Are you a follower of Christ? If so, this applies to you. He's our example, and we are to follow in his steps. This stuff is not options for us. Be mindful, as a follower of Christ, what it looks like, what he looks like. I've seen in some recent years more stirrings in some church movements where they are want to get more strongly active against what they perceive is wrong. They want justice, and they're going to fight to get it. And they become stronger and more militant and looking less and less like followers of Christ. Be careful. In closing, I want to share with you just a brief story I read recently about a fellow from Korea during the Korean War. You guys remember the Korean War? Some of you would. I don't guess uh, many of you were in the Korean War. When did it take place? It was in the 50s, wasn't it? In the 50s. There was a fellow there, a Korean. His name was Kim Jun Gon. And he had seen 2,000 out of 20,000 people on Chunam Island murdered by communists and they had dragged his family to a spot where 160 people from two villages had gathered to be the Christians it was here that Kim's father and his wife were beaten to death and he was left for dead as well when he revived and he sought safety at an acquaintance's house he was actually turned over to the communist again. And it was only the sudden appearance of an American ship off the island coast that saved him this time. For the soldiers hurried away to battle. So he hid out in the countryside until the South Korean army captured the island. The communists who killed his wife and his father were arrested. Because it was wartime, the police chief had authority to execute without trial. But as the chief prepared to kill the men, it was Kim who pleaded, spare them. They were forced to kill. The police chief showed great surprise. It was your family they killed. Why do you now ask for their lives? Kim replied quietly, because the Lord, whose I am and whom I serve, would have me show mercy to them. The communists were spared execution because of his plea. And news of this action had spread among other communist supporters in the area. 
When Kim later <clears throat> ascended a mountain to preach to the communists hiding out, he was not killed. Many of the communists became Christians. And when Kim finally left the island, there was a church, a flourishing church of about 108 members. And it was this man, Kim, that went on to found the Korean campus crusade for Christ. Now, we may never be called on to respond to evil in such a dramatic fashion as Kim Jun Gon. But we can begin by how we respond to personal abuse and mistreatment in our lives that we receive. Reacting to evil with goodwill doesn't always convert a person to become a follower of Christ. After all, Jesus himself was crucified, and he responded with good. In such cases, we simply commit our cause to God, as Jesus did. But if we are followers of Christ, we will want to be like him. Will you be like him? Stand with me. I told you at the start, as Albert Barnes said, this is a, a tough one. This is one of the most difficult precepts of Christianity. But we don't get to pick and choose. Being a Christian isn't patchwork theology where we just cut up and put together a kind of theology that we like. And want to follow. And we need to obey it. Will you obey him? Would you close your eyes for a moment? I want to ask two questions. The first is to maybe new people or people who aren't sure of being a Christian. The other one is to you who have perhaps been a Christian a long time. So the first question, have you, have you experienced the grace of Jesus Christ? Have you been forgiven? Do you know that all your sin is forgiven and that he saved you? Is there anybody here that would say, I'm not sure of that? There's a burden in my heart, though, and I want to know more of this. Anybody here? Would you quietly raise your hand without anyone looking? Just pray for me, Pastor. Pray for me. I'm not sure of my relationship to God. I don't know. Anybody here? I don't want to call you out. I won't come and grab you. I won't embarrass you. But I do want to pray for you and help. How many of you then, Christians, brothers, sisters, will you commit yourself this morning as a follower of Christ to responding to evil and bad the way Jesus did and the way that we are told to? Will you do that? Will you make that your commitment in prayer this morning? Not to respond evil for evil, but to go active one step farther and respond with something beautiful be prepared to respond with beauty beauty that will attract people to see the beauty of Christ will you make that your prayer brother sister let's pray and commit together right now then father lord in heaven thank you for your word to us the challenge of being a follower of Christ means living and acting as Jesus did. And we saw, Lord, that when he was reviled, when he was abused, when he was insulted, how he responded. And he says to us to respond in the same way. So, Lord, may we be prepared to actively show beauty in our character, beauty in our attitudes, in our responses so that people see your beauty, the beauty of Christ, that they see him in us. Lord, 
Give us strength because this is more difficult than we can handle. It's not in our natural character and ability. We need your spirit, Lord, at those times. Help us to walk with you, live for you, and be prepared. In Jesus' name. Please take a seat if you would.